Let's start off with uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. Verse 39. Let's wrap up our heroes of faith here. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith. So, meaning that all these Old Testament saints that were listed, that were given, have obtained a good report. They have a good resume, a good testimony because of their faith. Now, remember, as I... Uh, go through each and every verse, I tend to explain each and every word in the verse. Amen. The reason why is you hear the complaint nowadays from people, the Bible is too hard to understand. But what you're going to find out when I explain each and every word from the verse, it's not as hard as you think. So if I'm explaining something and you think that it's wordy or redundant, it's because I'm looking at one word from that verse and expounding on it. So try to look at the verse as you're hearing my explanation as well, okay? Now, now that I said that at verse 39, that the Old Testament saints, they have a good testimony regarding their faith, there's a heretical group that you have to avoid, and those are called mid-acts, mid-acts group. Mid-acts, they're also known as hyper-dispensationalists. Uh, why they're known as hyper-dispensationalists is because they're extreme in dispensationalism. They're hyper in their dispensationalism. So for some of you uh, who don't know what hyper-dispensationalism is, uh, let me explain dispensationalism for some of you who don't know. Dispensationalism is like from the example that I've given to you before, that uh, certain verses in the Bible, you have to apply it to the right time period and the right group of people. So not every verse in the Bible is going to apply to you. You have to be careful of that. That's how you get wrong doctrine. Well, then the devil, he's going to do it to the other extreme as well. Why? Because the devil's job is when there is a right doctrine as a reaction against a wrong doctrine, the devil will take that right doctrine as a reaction against wrong doctrine and make it go to the other extreme where it will still teach wrong doctrine. So that's where hyper-dispensationalists come in, and they take dispensationalism extremely. What they do is that, in their minds, they assume that throughout the Old Testament, that God never gave uh, salvation by grace at all, or you cannot find a Christian doctrine anywhere in any book of the Bible. They insist only Paul's 12 epistles is where you're going to find Christian doctrine. Now that is hogwash, otherwise we should chop off all the books out of our Bible and only keep 12. Then your Bible will be a booklet. It won't be a Bible, it will be a booklet, okay? So, there are other verses in the Old Testament, in the book of Hebrews, like I mentioned earlier, and other places where Christians can find doctrines applying to them. And the easy answer why is because some of those verses are going to match the Pauline epistles. <laughs> So it will be obviously Christian, but then other verses that contradict the Pauline epistles, then it's obviously not, and it doesn't apply to us. It's that simple. So one of the wrong thoughts that hyper-dispensationalists assume is that grace without works was never given in the Old Testament, but that is totally false. Now, do we admit, as actual dispensationalists, true dispensationalists, that Old Testament salvation was different from Christian salvation? Yes, because Jesus Christ, when he died, buried, and resurrected, this is considered to be salvation by faith, without works, right? So how can you believe in Christ without works if... Jesus didn't die on the cross to begin with, right? Then you're trusting in nothing. So in the Old Testament time, that was not available. So we admit that salvation by faith, not by works, was available. It started to become available at the cross for us New Testament Christians. And in the Old Testament time, what they had was a faith and works system. Now, that was demonstrated at Hebrews 11. We already went through that, right? When you look at these heroes of faith here, you're going to notice a lot of these Old Testament saints, because of their faith, they did this work. Because of their faith, they did that work, etc., etc. A lot of Christian churches misapply that. That's why they will insist 
that if you're really saved by faith, we should see works out of your life. Then they're teaching wrong doctrine. That's why they do not believe in a doctrine called once saved, always saved, or eternal security, or truly salvation by faith alone. Amen. Sola fide, you know? That if you really believe in the doctrine, then only believe in Christ for salvation. That's it, all right? So don't add, it's, don't add plus or anything like that. Don't add works. But the reason why they add works is because of Hebrews 11. Now, our easy answer is that this is Old Testament. <laughs> so those are for Old Testament Jews. Why? Because they didn't have the sacrifice of Christ available where it annihilated the works of the law for them. They had to live by the law. But So then hyper-dispensationalists, because they see that truth, then they're going to go to the extreme, assuming that every Old Testament character, God never demonstrated his grace uh, without works involved. No, that is actually false because if you look at Hebrews 11 again, all right, they're going to be surprised. Hebrews 11 demonstrated you heroes of faith, correct? So, excuse me. <clears throat> Within these heroes of faith, we see because of their works, they had strong faith. Noah was demonstrated. Building an ark is not an easy salvation, all right? You have to, if you think, uh, if I told you to build a church building for you to get saved, that's a lot of work, obviously. If I told you to build a ship that's three times as bigger than a football field, that's a lot of work, okay? That's what Noah had to do. So Noah, we see his works demonstrated from his faith for salvation. Uh, we see the same thing uh, with other Old Testament saints like Moses who gave the Mosaic Law. Uh, Joshua had to live by the Mosaic Law. Rahab, she had to do works. That's why James chapter 2 mentioned that Rahab, she had to do works with her faith for salvation. So there is no denying to that. But what about these other Old Testament saints? You're going to find out their works are not good. But God included them in the heroes of faith. You want me to give you one example? Verse 21, Jacob. You think his works were stellar? That guy was a dis conning, lying deceiver from birth till the end. All right. He, if you want uh, like a backsliding Christian, for example, that would be Jacob. If you want a guy who's worldly, who's carnal, who's fleshly, who's still a conniving deceiver, it's Jacob. <laughs> so his works is such a failure when you read the book of Genesis. But then how about that? He's considered heroes of faith. Oh, here's another example. What about uh, Jacob's sons? Right. Like Judah. Remember what he did with his daughter in law? That mess that he did? Yeah. Oh, but he's part of the heroes of faith. Isn't that something? Here's another one. Let's look at verse uh, 32. Look who's in there. 32. Samson. You think Samson had a great testimony as a Bible-believing Christian? Come on. We know that he committed fornication constantly. All right? He always did it till the day he died and he committed suicide and God considered him a saved person, hero of the faith. How about that? That would go against Catholic dogma. You, you, to go commit suicide, that's the unpardonable sin, etc. Well, this is uh, the clearest example and case where Samson who committed suicide was considered hero of faith. So no doubt, anti-works over here. <laughs> this is all faith. There are demonstrations that we see of people who got saved by faith. Another one is uh, David at verse 32, right? Yeah. So David is a great case to prove two things. He proved the case of during the Old Testament time, he realized that the law and the commandments were important for salvation. Yeah. So he said that the book of Psalm many times. However, David committed what? Murder and adultery. According to the works of the law, then, he's supposed to be stoned to death. He's supposed to be killed. But God's grace was greater than David's sin in spite of his failure of the works and made him an exception to the law and spared his life. According to Old Testament works of the law, according to Old Testament salvation, he should have been put to death. However, God made his life an exception 
and gave him grace instead. So we see a very clear case here of God's grace where David's works failed. Another one is Abraham. Uh, when we go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse, uh, let's see here, we'll go at, we'll go at verse t uh, 10, we'll go at verse 10. For he, that's Abraham, look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child. So notice that Abraham, that he had faith that the Lord will give him children. This is a demonstration of believing without works. Now, for those who still deny it, I don't know how hyper-dispensationalists can go around Romans 4. Go to Romans 4. Now, if hyper-dispensationalists believe that our apostle is the apostle Paul, that's where we should go by. And then, okay, then go by your apostle Paul. Notice that Paul argued that there were Old Testament people that were saved by grace and no works. The clear case is Romans 4. Romans 4, there's no way you can go around Romans 4 on that one. Go to Romans chapter 4. Notice he demonstrated two Old Testament cases. The Bible says in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So notice right here, Paul is arguing a case where Abraham then would not be justified by works for salvation. He said that plainly. Verse 3, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, see that? But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. How about that? So the author is arguing there's no work involved right here and just believing. And that's how Abraham got saved. And then he demonstrated David as an example at verse 6. Amen. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, yeah. saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Why did David write about that? Because he experienced that. He committed adultery and murder. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, some mid-Acts uh, people, they'll try to go around it by saying, well, Abraham and David, they're just simply typologies. But the easy debunking to that is, yeah, they're a typology of what? Yeah, of what? Exactly. Of what? <laughs> exactly. They're a typology of simply believing in uh, Christ, yeah. simply by faith, all right? So even though they, uh, so I shouldn't say Christ because Jesus didn't die on the cross yet, but they simply had faith and there was no works involved. And Paul used that as the typology of salvation by faith, no works involved. If they weren't saved like that, then Paul would not have demonstrated that. So, the, of course, the hyper-dispensationalists, they might use James chapter 2, where Abraham was justified by works when he offered up Isaac the son as a sacrifice. They'll point out uh, cases, which we don't deny, where David mentioned in the book of Psalm that you have to obey the law, keep the commandments to have eternal life. But the simple answers to those things is that throughout the Old Testament time, that is the general rule. They had to do faith and works for salvation. We don't deny that. Hebrews 11 demonstrated it. But at the same time, Hebrews 11 demonstrated the exceptionable cases within that. So throughout the Old Testament time, the Lord gave exceptions in certain cases and certain people where he overlooked their failure and work and just counted them saved. You might say, why would God do that? Because he's very gracious. Amen. All right? So yeah, they didn't receive the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That salvation was not operating where they can receive faith alone and no works involved. The Old Testament saints didn't get that. 
but God was still gracious and merciful that he implemented some form of that yeah. throughout the Old Testament because he's a gracious and merciful God. Even in everyday life, all right, that's normal. In order for society and for humans to function well, you have to have generally rules, laws involved. But if everybody lives strictly by the law, then you're, uh, you're pretty much a dodo bird. They're going to think that you're, you're sticking the mud. You're, you're, oh, come on, give me a break here. So don't businesses in the workplace and don't governments and cops, uh, when they pull you over or then they see you mess up in one of the rules, don't they cut you a break? Cut you some slack? They do that, don't they? Why? Because there's something merciful, gracious in there, understanding of your unique situation or person that you are. See, so that is just common sense in everyday life too, is that generally there are rules, but at times there can be exceptions. So generally throughout the Old Testament, there are rules, law, works, but also there are exceptions because of grace being gracious. All right, let's go back. Let's go back, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. There is no doubt when you read that book, there were many times when God laid out laws and rules. He gave exceptions. There are so many times he did that because he's a very gracious and merciful God. So you'll notice right here how many people fall into wrong doctrine if they don't understand right dispensationalism, right? Dispensationalism is the number one doctrine that will solve 90% of wrong doctrines. People will think that Oh, salvation by faith, not by works, was the same from beginning of Genesis to the end. No, that's not true. Then what are you going to do with verses that show that you have to do works to show your faith or works to keep your faith? What are you going to do with that? Also, there are verses that demonstrate disproving hyper-dispensationalists that there are times that God laid out exceptional cases because he's a gracious, merciful God. So a lot of people don't understand right dispensationalism. That's so important. You need to know right dispensationalism. That way you can get your doctrines right. It will resolve 90% of wrong doctrine. It is a hermeneutical method that is essential to properly interpret the scriptures. Amen. All right. Let's go to Hebrews 11 and then continue reading verse 39. Again, verse 39. The next part reads... Uh, Receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Meaning that those Old Testament saints who had a good testimony from their faith, they didn't receive the promise yet. Why? Because God provided a better thing for us and those Old Testament saints. He reserved a better thing for all of us here so that those people who are not with us, they without us, right? Meaning that, meaning those Old Testament saints or the believers before us, the saints before us that are no longer with us, that are not with us, that are dead or deceased, they're not made perfect yet. So in other words, they didn't get their perfected full reward. Now, some people might assume that that's referring to a resurrection. They're not perfected yet. And they will use the context of verse 35. You see that? Verse 35, the last wording there, says they might obtain a better resurrection. So actually, that is true. That is true. This is referring to a resurrection. However, there are a few problems here, okay? The promise, if you're going to uh, read all those verses, it's not going to be limited to a resurrection. The resurrection for the Jews here, now remember this is Old Testament saints, right? Jews demonstrated. This is the book of Hebrews. The promises that they were waiting for, and if you recall, with some of those Old Testament saints, it had to do with the promised land. So the promise is the promised land. Remember the example of Abraham that I mentioned before? Abraham didn't receive his reward yet 
because he believed that he was going to get it one day, which is a land grant. We read it before at verse 10, right? Verse 9 and verse 10. So it's not just a resurrection, just rising up from the dead. Another problem with that is that the Old Testament saints, they did experience a resurrection at Matthew 27. You look at Matthew 27, the bodies of the Old Testament saints resurrected and arose. Yeah. So we have to realize that this resurrection, what it's referring to, is sometime, now remember, Hebrews is to the Hebrews during when? The end times, tribulation. Now, is there a resurrection in the tribulation? And is there a regaining of the promised land? Yes. Go to Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 37. Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 37. Notice right here that the resurrection for the Jews is referring to their nation of Israel being restored. Now, look at what the United Nations is doing. Look at those uh, Muslim nations, what they're doing to the current land of Israel. If I were them, I'd be scared to death. I'd be scared to death. Because that is something, that land grant is what God promised to the Jews, and he's not going to go back on his word on that. Now, when you go to, uh, let's see right here, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Notice the resurrection for the nation of Israel one day is a return to their promised land. And obviously we know that 1,000 years, Christ will reign on the earth. And that's going to be within the context of the nation of Israel. Ezekiel 37. Notice that the Bible says in verse 12, verse 12, a resurrection... Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. See that? Mm -hmm. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So notice right here that the Jews, when they get their resurrection, it's not just something body-wise. This is referring to their land grant as well. Now look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Now this is at the end of the tribulation. The Antichrist and his kingdom is conquered. So then Christ rules over the earth. Christ reigns his kingdom for a thousand years. And notice what happens, a resurrection of saints in the tribulation. Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Till the Oh, so notice right here, nations, right? So there's United Nations. Mm -hmm. So I don't, wouldn't want to be on their side, all right? No, be right. careful, you know, when you're looking at news and... Both sides, Republican, Democrat, whatever they say, I don't care if it's Fox News or CNN. Amen. So be careful of what they say and then whose politics or whose side you pick. Don't believe a word they say. Believe what the book says right here. Amen. When it comes to United Nations, what they're telling you yeah. in the news, what you're watching, be careful. Guard your heart on that. That's the devil's territory. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. See, rulership and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Those are tribulation saints who got uh, martyred because of the Antichrist persecution. And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So notice right here, verse 6. Verse 6, blessed, uh, verse 5, excuse me, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. See that? So notice right here that the Jews experience a resurrection during the timeline of the tribulation. This resurrection that Hebrews 11 is referring to, remember, it's addressed to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2 told you 
that this is about future end times. And remember, chapter 11 pointed out a land grant. And remember, scripture with scripture, Revelation 20, Ezekiel 37 showed you this is the right interpretation. Okay? So we know that uh, when we go back to Hebrews 11, go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, the apostle, basically what he's writing here to the Hebrews who are going to be undergoing the tribulation, that think about your Old Testament Hebrew forefathers, those before us. They, because of their faith, they endured. Remember that? That was all in Hebrews 11. They endured. They had a strong faith. They held it out. They chose suffering. They chose persecution. So the author is emphasizing that to Hebrews in tribulation. Why? Because obviously they're going to undergo persecution from the Antichrist. So he's trying to encourage them, think about our forefathers before us, how they endured, how they were able to overcome so that they can get their reward in the end. And they didn't receive their reward now, but they're going to get it later. Yeah. And that reward is what? Not just a bodily resurrection, but also their land grant, Amen. their rulership their rulership as well. So I forgot to include that one. So it includes rulership. So now we understand how this applies doctrinally to Hebrews in the tribulation. Now, can Christians claim some of that? Absolutely. The reason why is because I've demonstrated from other verses that Christians, we have to, when we are saved by faith, just because we are saved by faith and we're going to heaven, that doesn't mean that's the end. Once saved, always saved. Faith alone, not by works. Correct. But how you live in your Christian walk, the works that you do in this life, God's going to reward you. So just because you go to heaven doesn't mean that you're going to get rewarded. So even though you're going to go to heaven because you're saved by faith, what about your rewards? Some of you are going to be empty-handed. So that's where Christians... They can claim some of the verses right here at Hebrews 11 because it matches with Pauline epistles. And we're not going to turn to those verses. I'm not going to get into that doctrine. But I've demonstrated from Hebrews 11 some of the verses where Christians get rewarded, right, for enduring. We saw some of those verses. Christians, we do have rulership because of the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 d demonstrates Christians who fail in their works, and they are still saved by faith. They don't get burned by the fire, but they lose their works in the fire. So that's proof that of once saved, always saved, but you get no rewards. Anyways, so that's where Christians uh, can claim it as well, where we endure and we can receive the promise. Don't you want your rapture? Your rapture, when God raptures us before the tribulation and God launches the tribulation underneath those tribulation Jews, don't you want to go up there and gain your reward, gain a better resurrection, better rulership, etc.? So God will grant that to you, but you've got to hold on, all right? So we can claim some of the verses right here for us today. All right, chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Meaning, when he says wherefore, he's trying to point out what this means is from what I previously discussed to you. That's what he's pointing out. From his previous dis discussion are all these what? He's given witnesses here. All these saints before us who died, who endured, who got tortured, who got persecuted, who endured because of their faith. Such witnesses. That's why Paul says we are surrounded. That's what compass means. It means to be surrounded by, encircled. And here's that figurative expression, so great a cloud of witnesses. Meaning that when uh, in we are going our Christian race in life, We are surrounded by 
so many witnesses yeah. who will witness against you, who are your evidence, who are your testimonies that, hey, if I can endure it, you can endure it too. That's the idea. Here are Old Testament, well, it won't be accurate to say just Old Testament. I know generally it is, but in Hebrews 11, it was demonstrated more as saints. So I'll just write it that way. Saints before us. Saints before us who endured. Can you imagine? Both the tribulation Jew and the Christian saint, when they go before uh, God's judgment, he can pull up any one of these witnesses, either at Old Testament, New Testament, or sometime in the future, and then use them against us. Hey, they endured. How come you couldn't endure? Or right, you try making excuses to God. I can't go to church. I can't pass out tracts. I can't soul win. I can't stay away from I sin. I can't get victory, you know, because this is such a wicked Bay Area. So many liberals. God, you don't blame me. And then God pulls up a nine-year-old girl Come on. Wow. who was tortured during the Dark Ages, standing for her faith in Jesus Christ. And you try that. Yep. See, that's why <laughs> we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, that verse is so great a cloud of witnesses. You know what that means? That means no matter what great, how great your excuse is, your, the greatness of your excuse won't compare with this great cloud of witnesses. Amen. You will be ashamed for opening your mouth with that excuse at the judgment. Amen. All right? And I pray you don't say it on this earth too. Because God, remember, he records every word you said and will judge that against you. So, Matt, don't say embarrassing words like that when, the, when these cloud of witnesses are going to be surrounding you, when God judges you. So we have no excuse. We can endure. We can overcome, no matter how great the suffering is. Now, that's easy for me to say it, but actually, to be real, no, it's not easy for me to say it, let alone live it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm human like you. I'm flesh like you. I don't, uh, I mean... They put me on a rack and torture me. I, I might be the first one to deny. I don't know. You might say, oh, really, Pastor? I'm flesh. I'm human. I don't know. I don't trust myself. That's why I just try the very best that I can to serve God. I'm flesh like you. That's hard to believe, right? But I'll admit it. I'm flesh like you. I'm just doing the best that I can like you. If there was anything great that I did, I'll be honest, it's not because of me. <laughs> I just did the best I could like you. Amen. And then by enduring, enduring, God brings the fruit. God brings the result at the end. And that's why I am what I am today, because of God, not because of me. But that's why I'm urging you to do the same thing like I did. Just keep doing your best. Just keep enduring. If you fail, pick yourself back up again. You just have to keep suffering, enduring it. Notice the next part. The verse says, let us lay aside every weight. Okay, so what we're going to get down to, this is Hebrews 12 is probably the best passage uh, to talk about the Christian race. Now, there are three uh, passages that talk about the Christian race very well. The three passages that describe the Christian race will be uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll go there eventually. The other one is Hebrews chapter 12, which we're looking at right now. And then uh, the other one is 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. These are the three standard classical passages, and there are more. You could probably use 2 Timothy 2 if you want to, all right? But these are the classical passages that discuss the Christian race. We talk about our walk with Jesus Christ, correct? Christian walk. When you walk with the Lord, it's not all the time walking. You're going to eventually run. So even though we call it a race, a race, you must understand, is always not like sprinting. There are times you're just going to have to walk it off. You're going to have to jog it. 
or you're going to have to sprint it. Does that make sense? Uh, in marathons or in long runs, you have to pace yourself. So when we talk about the Christian walk, it's not all the time walking. Then you're just lazy. You're just backsliding. If you're sprinting, then what you're doing is no wonder you're exhausting yourself and you're getting bitter at God when God didn't mean to make it too hard for you. So in the Christian marathon, you always have to look at yourself and say, am I pacing right? When you need to kick yourself and run, kick yourself and run. When you need to calm down and find a break moment, you need to walk with God. That's very important. So we're going to describe the race here, and there are several hindrances that we're going to demolish here. First one, let us lay aside every weight. So the author is pleading to his audience to please put aside anything that will hold you back. That's the weight. When you run, when you do your Christian race, are you going to carry baggage with you? Obviously not. If some of you are carrying baggage then that's the reason why you haven't been growing in the Lord, okay? Now the question to you is, what is your baggage? What is your weight? That should not be the case here. Go to Galatians 5. First question. That way you can make sure you're running your race properly. Do you have weight? Do you have any weight? What is your weight? Is it your love life? Is it your job? Is it your school? Is it your pride? Pride is very big. Ego is very big. People just can't say I'm sorry to the other person. Why? We just have so much pride in us. So do you have any weights? What's holding you back? What's slowing you down? from coming to church? What's slowing you down from witnessing to souls? What's slowing you down from uh, reading your Bible, praying? You have to ask yourself that. What's slowing you down from growing in the Lord? Galatians chapter 5, a very good verse. I preached a sermon out of this before, I think two of them. It's a very good one. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7. Ye did run well. See that? So you're running well, but who did hinder you? that he should not obey the truth. Some of you, some of you were soul winners. Some of you attended church. Some of you served God and stayed away from sin. Some of you did. What happened? Right? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Work happened. Busyness happened. Stress happened. Trial happened. Trauma happened. Blah, 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 blah happened. There's always something that happened. Oh, wait. Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9. When you're racing, it's not supposed to be easy. That's the problem with people. They think that Christian race is easy. That's not true. When you're racing, a marathon is something that is rigorous, you have to understand. It's something that is very hard. When you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what discipleship is, okay? It, Basically, no turning back, nothing to hold you back. Look at this. If you want to follow the Lord, look at verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow, follow thee whithersoever thou goest. You know what Jesus said? And Jesus said unto him, Foxes of holes and birds of the airs have nest, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. <laughs> Lord, couldn't you just let him in? Imagine if uh, somebody wanted to attend our church and then I told them this is the requirement for church membership. Then nobody would be in church, even me, okay? <laughs> be because Jesus pointed out right here, he knew the weakness of this person is, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to be uh, wandering everywhere and there's going to be no roof over my head. So I know you can't follow me. So he knew his weakness. His weakness was he wanted to have his settled down life. Isn't that what we Americans want? Isn't that, that's why, isn't that why they're all migrating out of California? Because they can't settle down here. They want to find a place to settle down. Why do you think I didn't move out yet? Because my job isn't to settle down. It's to fight and keep preaching what God called me to do here. All right, we look at verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Well, that's understandable. 
I'd allow him on that. But look what Jesus said. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. That's horrible. Why would Jesus say that? Because the question is, then would the death of a loved one hold you back from serving God? See, that's the bottom line. When you follow God, what's holding you back? Jesus wants to make sure every area of your life has been surrendered to him and nothing holds you back. When you look at uh, verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Oh my goodness. And you wonder why wickedness is growing in our world. Yeah, because it's easy to sin and to become wicked. But to serve God takes a lot of sacrifice and requirement. Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So what's holding you back? If it's an understandable, very sensitive, touchy scenario that can hold you back from serving God, you bet your life that's going to happen to you one day and you got to be prepared for that. All right, the next one is, and the sin which does so easily beset us. So not only we are to cast aside things that can hold us back, but also sins that, I like how it says, easily beset. Beset means to be set into place. Sin is so easy to be put in front of you. Can I get an amen on that one? Sin is so easy to be put in front of you. I mean, you live in the Bay Area. I mean, it's all around you, all right? There's no way to get out of it, all right? Billboards and now on your phones, all right? And you're watching a video and then you don't mean this advertisement to come out, but that advertisement just happened to come out, right? Uh, and then uh, wherever you walk, wherever you go, you can't escape it. They're everywhere, and you're going to hear something that's ungodly, and you're going to come across sin that is easily set in front of you. How easily set in front of you? As if you are reading your Bible and you're praying, and then all of a sudden sin is set easily set before you in your mind, and you're like, where'd that come from? Here you are daydreaming when you're trying to read that book. Our brains have become so fried, it's been used to daydream and imagine because we live in a world filled with imaginations. This is art, right? This is culture. That kind of garbage that they're trying to do to you. So because of that, it, be it became habitual now. It became habitual. We don't want to live a life that way. We don't want to live life that way. And unfortunately, people are. Now... With sin that is easily set in front of you, you got to get away from that. So go to the book of Proverbs. Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. And then we'll look at uh, chapter, I think, 4. Chapter 4. I lost the passage here. I don't know if anyone can find that. Ah, yeah, it is chapter 4. And then uh, verse 15. Chapter 4 and verse 15. So when you're running... It's not like, look at this now, when you're running, it's not like that you're running into sin, okay? When you're running, it's like sin is right placed before you. Now, you know what a runner does if you're running? You're not going to go, and then like the dog, <laughs> lick the vomit. Second Peter 2. That's what some of you are doing, right? You know what you're going to naturally do if you see that. I'll tell you what me and the missus does when we walk on a nice hiking trail. We walk around it. We don't look at it. We don't look back either. When you walk away, obviously, it's like you got to not look at it. That's just common sense. But when you're going like this... Uh, something wrong with you, right? Yes. Something wrong with you. Go to Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. We easily pass by it. That's it. Proverbs 4, 15. Proverbs 4, 15. The Bible says, avoid it. Amen. Pass not by it. Oh, so it's even to the point where you don't even pass by it. You got to completely avoid it. 
turn from it and what? Pass away. That's what you do with sin. When sin is easily set in front of you, you just go away from it. All right? You just go away from it. Run away from it. But see, people don't want to do that. They want to dabble with sin. They want to go close. They want to look back just once. Now, remember, I'm not saying that all of you are chasing after sin. Do you know why you keep messing up a sin? It's not because you're chasing after it. It's because it's easily set in front of you. Remember last Hebrews teaching? I wish that somehow in some way we can live like Amish people in our own little island and have only Bible-believing Christians and holiness all around us and we all live happily ever after. But that's not how it works. All right, Sin is always around you. Suffering is always around you. And it will stick with you till the day you die. You can't separate from that. So because of that, that's the reason why it's always set in front of you, even if you don't want it. It will. So what you have to do while you're running is to get away from it. All the time, you got to run away from it. All right. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 12 again. So the next question is, which sin easily, easily, which sin easily gets put in front of you? If you know what it is, then why does it keep doing that? Right? Why does it keep doing that? You all have to think and pray about that. You're going to have to change your behavior, the places you go. All right. Some of you need to clean house. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I don't like that. I don't like that. Why? Because I'm an American like you where I want instant gratification. And I need it immediately because when I'm opening something online, the browser is just taking too stinking long. We want it now, 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 now. That's our problem. But this verse says that when we're running, let us run with patience. We got to pace ourselves. We got to wait on the Lord in this race that is set before us. So God... I like how it's, said, uh, how it's worded here. God puts the race in our, into our lives. So don't run away from that. If God puts you through a trial or a situation, this race that is set before you, the thing is, is the, pro the mistake many people do is run away from it. Yeah. But when it comes to sin, they don't run away from it. Come on. So when God puts the race before you, what you're supposed to do is accept it. And no matter how long it takes, just be patient and stay there. Just be patient and stay there. I don't care how long the trial or the affliction or what test God puts you in, you got to learn to wait on the Lord, Amen. no matter how long it takes. Amen. That's important if you're going to survive the race. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 9. This is the hardest crown to achieve at the judgment seat of Christ, in my opinion. Why? Because we're such impatient people. We're very bad in disciplining ourselves, especially in this culture, this area. Like I told you before in my Sunday sermon, our, our problem is we're very, very lax. We're very, very lax. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, 24, Knowing not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Remember, the author talks about attaining the reward, right? In the race. So this is matching up with that. Amen. Verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is what? Temperate in all things. You know what that is? That's being self-controlled. In what? In everything. If you know in the business place and when you enter into college, what they're training you to do is you need to learn to pace yourself. You need to be self-disciplined. You need to manage things yourself, overcome problems yourself, etc. Notice that verse 27, it follows in line with verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That's a hard thing to do. This flesh is going by impulse and 
when you're studying or working in a project, the tendency is to keep working, to keep studying. Yeah. But that's not healthy. No. Sometimes you got to slow down and stop. And then when you're slowing down and stopping, it's hard to pick it back up again yeah. and start and speeding up in your work. Why? Because you're controlling your flesh. Nobody wants to press the up and down button on the flesh. The flesh wants to say, leave it alone. Let it do what I want to do. Yeah, amen. I'm preaching at this flesh. It's a wicked flesh. It's a wicked flesh. The flesh wants to go however way it feels, but a lot of times you're going to have to push it when you got to push it, and you got to hold it back when it got to hold back. Don't go by whatever your feeling wants to go, because that feeling is going to kill you one day if you're not careful. Because notice right here, the last part of verse 27, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So yeah, you're going to cast yourself off. You don't want to be a castaway. All right. Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, notice that this patience is necessary. Matching with what? Oh, did you forget Hebrews 11? This uh, Christian race that is supposed to have patience, you forgot, matching with Hebrews chapter 11 with enduring, right? Having faith, right? So the reason why you're not patience, patient, excuse me, is because the question you got to be asking yourself is based off of Romans 5 and Hebrews 11 that I pointed out before you. Are you enduring? Can you endure? No, you can't endure. That's why you have no patience. Do you believe that the trial, the race that God set before you is the right place to be and you should stay in there, don't run away from it, and don't go to any other place and the best place is the place where God put you in? Do you have faith in that? If you don't, that's why you don't have patience. Did you choose suffering? No, of course you didn't choose suffering. That's the reason why you're not patient. And hence, that's the reason why the Romans 5 cycle has no application to you. Remember the Romans 5 cycle? The Romans 5 cycle is tribulation, which you chose, right? The suffering, work it, patience, patience, experience, experience hope. It builds up more faith. If you keep running by that Romans 5 cycle, you will survive. And it becomes bigger. The faith becomes bigger. The endurance, no matter how bigger it is, it becomes stronger to bear. So you have to look at these areas. This was already given out at Romans 5 and Hebrews 11. So if you don't have patience, it's because you didn't make a decision on these four things yet. That you have to examine yourself. The question is, do you have patience? Now we're going to look at verse 2, the classical passage. Amen, amen, amen. Our hero, our champion right here. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. So for you to keep up this marathon and to win at the end, you got to look at Jesus Christ. Why? Now, the problem with a lot of commentators is that they're going to say that Jesus Christ is the forerunner. In other words, that he started out the race and he's the one who uh, finishes our race. So in other words, he's our example to follow. But this is more than that. The author means he's the creator. Yeah. And finisher means that he's the very end of it. Now, that's Jesus' language, right? Jesus said... I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen. That matches well with author and finisher. Now, what does that mean, that statement? I'm beginning and end. I'm Alpha, Omega, uh, author, finisher. That means from the very beginning to the end, he is it. So what's my bottom line right here? The verse is the author and finisher of our what? Faith. Okay. Why do you have faith in Christ? Because he is faith itself. Everything that uh, surrounds, begins and ends with faith. Why is that so important for you to understand? Because that's the reason why you're having trouble believing. Your faith 
is dependent upon Jesus Christ. I don't know if you knew that. The substance, the entity, the very person, God himself, deity, is the one that is contingent for your faith. So if you're struggling in your faith, then it shows that uh, the question is, this must not be real to you then, Jesus Christ. So he is author. He is finisher. So when you are struggling in your faith, you got to realize Jesus Christ is the one that makes up for that. So that writer, that uh, the Apostle Paul says, looking unto Jesus. So you have to look at Jesus, who is the one contingent for your faith. If you keep looking at Jesus, then you're going to keep your faith intact. Then you're going to keep being strong. Then you're going, to in, you're going to keep enduring. But you're not looking at Jesus Christ. Why? Because you keep looking at trial. You keep looking at Tao. You keep looking at the world. You keep looking at higher ed. You keep looking at knowledge. You keep looking at yourself, yourself, yourself. Feeling number one with feeling number two with feeling number three, feeling four. And it's all about my feelings. And that's the reason why you are feeling wreck. And you have no faith. Okay, so look at Jesus. Verse 2 keeps explaining, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What are you looking at? Jesus, when he endured the cross. I mean, none of you uh, ever got nailed on a cross, so you didn't have it rough as Jesus. But Jesus Christ, when he endured that suffering, he kept what? Putting the joy before him. So when that race is set before you, our problem is, is that our eyes are set on the race, and when the poop is set in front of you, set before, the sin set before you, your eyes are set on this, but you've got to remember Hebrews 11? You forgot. You got to look at that invisible. Did you forget that? The invisible thing is the one that's set before you, or you need to set before you. Sin is easily set before you, but joy is not easily set before you, is it? So that's the reason why you need to set it. Jesus set that joy before him. So his eye is looking at the joy that was set before him. The prize, the reward in heaven. If Jesus is doing that, we need to do the same thing as well. So we need to keep looking at the joy that's set before us, not the race, which can discourage us because we don't like this long, weary road. And our favorite hymn is, Tempted and tried, we're off made to wander. Farther along, we'll know all about it. That just happens to be our favorite hymn. Instead of just constantly looking at the race and singing that song, you got to look at the joy. And you've got to, uh, instead of looking back at the mock right here, you got to look at this. Why? Because that's important. Moses did that. Remember that? Through the eyes of faith, he's supposed to do that. Jesus did that. Look at Isaiah 53. Notice our example did that. Isaiah chapter 53. That's good. Isaiah chapter 53. Now, this is the classic passage about Jesus dying on the cross, right? But as he endured the cross, notice what he set before him. Look at verse 11. Isaiah chapter uh, 53, and then verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be what? Satisfied, Satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Notice the joy that was set before him. Notice that at verse 11, see, what is he seeing in spite of the travail? The satisfaction, the joy. Look at verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Wow. So that was his joy, his blessing that he received, his reward. All right. The next part of Hebrews 12. Notice right here, it says despising uh, the shame. So he despised shame itself. Go to Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50. 
Some of you might say, well, I despise shame too. That's the reason why I keep running away from shameful things. That's the reason why I have a hard time accepting shameful things, humbling myself, going through the embarrassing mistakes. I don't want to shame myself. No, that's not what the author meant by despising shame. In other words, he ex uh, what he did was he accepted the shame. He let shame confront him, and he didn't let that bother him. That's the despising there. But see, you let it bother you. You let shame cling on to you. So what you need to do with shame is when you confront shame, you need to despise it. You can't let that bother you. You got to look down on it and say, so what? I'm going to go through this. Do any of you do that? No, we always let embarrassing mistakes and our shame and our guilt prevent us from coming back to church, from picking ourselves back up again against sin and serving God. You need to despise that. You need to say, so what? I'm getting right with God. I want to serve God again. I want to live clean. Do you confront shame like that? Look at Isaiah 50, verse 6. When Jesus Christ endured the cross, he did that. You can't. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. See, he despised it. But you hide from your shame, do you? Don't you? All right, go to Hebrews 12 again. Hebrews 12 again. The last part says, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus Christ, because he looked at the joy set before him, he got what he wanted. The Lord God, the Father, put him and set him, that joy that was set before him, at the right hand of the Father. Now, how about you? Are you looking at the joy set before you? Is Jesus your author and finisher of your faith? Now, we'll cover three and four. Three and four is a lot better, actually. Uh, it's too bad I couldn't cover that. I hope to cover three and four next time. Lots of good words here that will really help you in racing and enduring suffering and then despising the shame and bearing it. So don't miss out on that one. Hopefully, I'll talk to you next time. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been helpful to us. We've grown more in knowledge of the scriptures and that we will run our Christian race the, patiently, rightly, not looking behind us and not looking at the sin, but to keep going on because you're our author and finisher. You're what uh, consists of our faith, Father. So I pray that we'll believe in it, trust in it, cling on to it and look at that. And that way we can keep going on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.